Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth. I'm so glad you're here for worship with us this morning. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And whether you're joining us from here in Fort Worth, from somewhere else in Texas, or anywhere else in the world, I am so grateful that you are here with us today. This 930 service is called The Gathering. And for those of you who are regulars at The Gathering, I want to point out that things are a little bit different this morning. One, I'm normally not uh, leading the service in my liturgical vestments during the gathering service. We normally don't have a professional brass ensemble leading us in worship for the gathering service, and I want to explain why that is. And the reason is, is because this is the first worship of the new year. This is the first Sunday of 2021, and if you've been attending uh, church here for a number of years, you'll know that I take New Year's really seriously. I love the beginning of the new year. I love making a fresh start. I love announcing that things are fresh and new again and really emphasizing that when we come together and worship as a church. For the last couple months, I've been thinking about and preparing for this worship service, and 2021, of course, is coming right on the heels of 2020. And so I thought what I would like to do when we begin our first service of the new year is really provide space for us to look at and acknowledge the grief and the hurt and the loss that we all experienced in the year 2020. This has been the first year in my ministry where I know that every single person who will participate in worship today has experienced some kind of trauma in the last year. We all have. And so my idea was, what I would love to do is start the 2021 year of worship with a service that emphasized grief and loss, but also hope and grace and God's presence in the midst of it. And there's no better service that we have that does that than our services of memorial or funerals. The liturgy is beautiful. It's focused on God's hope and God's love. And so I thought it would be great is to have a service that really provided space for us to hear those things afresh and new. My favorite sort of music is this kind of brass jazz funeral music. So I thought it would be a wonderful service of worship and it'll allow us to acknowledge grief and loss. And hopefully as many of us could, as possible will be doing it not like we typically experience it, which is right in the middle of grieving the loss of a loved one. That was my plan for the last couple months. Any of you who have read uh, communications that came out from our church this week know that's not the situation today. It's over the holidays, so some of you may have missed it, but on Wednesday evening, John Howard, the executive director of our church, passed away as a result of complications from COVID-19. Hundreds of you know John. John and his wife Liz have been a fixture of this church for 30 years. They've been a founding members of the Good Neighbors Sunday School class, one of the largest and most vibrant Sunday school classes of our church. John has served in a million capacities in Fort Worth, both in other nonprofit capacities and in an immense amount of leadership here at the church. He served on every committee at every level, saying yes over and over and over again to any way he could be a part of helping his church be strong and vibrant and make disciples for Jesus. Christ. John and Liz raised their children in this church, and after John retired from the first phase of his professional career, he came on staff a few years ago to bring some of his professional expertise and help lead here at the church at a senior level. John's been an incredibly valuable part of our church for three decades, and even if you don't know who he is, it's a large church. Not everybody knows everybody. You've seen John. I promise you, if you've been here, you've seen John. If you volunteered with Kids Hope, helping mentor at-risk kids, you served alongside John. If you've gone to the First Street Methodist Mission to help serve people in need, you've served alongside John. If you've done Habitat for Humanity or Cowtown Brush Up, you've served along John. He's organized all those things. If you've ever come to worship at 800 West 5th Street in the last few years, you've been greeted by John, who stood out front in his suit and his cup of coffee and welcomed every single person to church for years now. None of those things were in his job description, by the way. It's the kind of man John is. So as we experience this time of worship today, it's going to be built on that theme of memorial, of acknowledging grief and loss and recognizing at the same time the promise and the hope in the midst of it. This isn't a memorial service for John. John's memorial will happen in upcoming days and weeks as we coordinate with his family, and we'll share details for those of you who I know will want to be a part of it. But I'd be lying if I said that today's time of worship in my heart and in the heart of so many of our staff and members of our church wasn't clouded by that very grief and loss for a man that we dearly loved. 
I hope you join me in continuing to pray for John, for his wife Liz, for his children and their grandchildren, and for all the people who are experiencing that grief and loss today. And yet, in the midst of deep and dark times, in the midst of grief and loss, in the midst of hurt and pain, still we worship. Now, would you prepare your hearts and minds for worship as the DFW Brass leads us. Now hear these words of grace. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and I'm life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also.
Friends, we gather together on this liminal Sunday, a bridge between the year past and the year to come. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human losses in this difficult year. We come together in hope, believing that brighter days are ahead of us. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Join me now in prayer. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us who we name in our hearts before you. Especially we praise you for your faithful presence with us and with all who call upon your name in times of trouble. To all who grieve, grant your peace. Let your perpetual light shine upon them and help us so to believe where we have not seen, that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture comes from selections of verses in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. So if you have your physical copy of the Bible in front of you, it may be a little bit too difficult to follow. Um, however, I will read slowly and uh, hear these words. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I have said these things to you while I'm still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. I'm so glad that we get to spend some time together. And uh, I'm choosing to sit down. Uh, have you ever had a time where what you either had to talk about or do felt challenging or difficult, and if even the slightest breeze came by, it would just blow you right over? Um, I felt like that every time I went to, to bat when I played Little League Baseball. And I just wanted to kind of sit on something that made me feel a little bit more sturdy and, and uh, grounded today. So grown-ups do that too, kids, so don't think uh, that uh, those of us who are grown-ups don't go through some of those same things. And you heard earlier during the greeting about a, the, a kind of bridge time between times linking one year to the next, and we're going to explore that this morning. And I can't help but notice that the place I'm sitting is maybe the biggest bridge between two spaces in our entire sanctuary because I'm sitting between the communion table where we'll have the Lord's Supper and remember the night before Jesus died. And then right here in front is the baptismal font. And inside that, as you know, is water and where we baptize. And in our faith tradition, typically that's baby. So we have a reminder uh, of death and we have a reminder of birth. And uh, how powerful is that? And so with our time this morning, I thought what we would do because as uh, kids, I, I say this to grown-ups on your behalf often, is that children need and want more than rainbows and butterflies. And you know that before we can mend, we first have to see the broken places. 
And before we can dance in the light, we first have to at least acknowledge the darkness. So what we're going to do this morning is called a litany of letting go. And you've done a litany before. Sometimes at the beginning of our worship service, we'll have a litany where a member of the clergy will say something, and then you will say the same response. You know, our, uh, when we do our prayers of the people, that's kind of like a litany where different names are said, and then we always will say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That's kind of like what a litany is. So your part is going to be Today we let go. And I want you to use your bodies. It's important to do that because I think sometimes when we feel it, it helps us internalize a little bit more. So as I say something that we need to let go of, something in this past year 2020 uh, that, that has made life really difficult, I want you to kind of ball your fists a little bit. Don't hurt because I, I, church isn't supposed to hurt. But make fists. And then when we get to your part where you say, today we let go, let go with your hands, okay? Here we go. For all of the canceled concerts, for all of the canceled camps, for all of the canceled games and experiences that we missed, today we let go. For all of the opportunities missed to be together here in the church building, for all of the worship services, for all of the parties, for all of the festivals, for all the Easter egg hunts, all those things that we look forward to every year and we miss, today we let go. For the anger we feel at the just not fairness of it all, today we let go for the genuine loss we feel about all those missed experiences, about all those missed opportunities to connect with people, today we let go. And even for the, the very real loss, even the loss of a person, I can't ask you to let go of that not in a million years, would ask you to let go of that. Because even though a loved one, a friend, a family member, a colleague has died, and we won't get to see them, we won't get to hear their voice, not in a million years would we ever let go of the love we feel for them. And that's it. And in that moment, we realize why it's so important to let go of whatever we can that is holding us down and that is keeping us down because we need our strength in this new year to hold on to all that is worth holding. So now with our litany, here's what I invite you to do is put your hands on your heart. Please do it at home. I hope you're doing it. And I'm going to say something and now I want you to say, today we hold on. For loved ones who have died, but whose love lives on in our hearts, today we hold on. For the accepting, loving community that we absolutely are and know that we can be, today we hold on. For the promise of a year filled with hope, peace, joy, love, and light, today we hold on. And for the hope that we will be together, that there will be a time when we are all in this place and there is more laughing and singing and dancing and greeting than we know what to do with, today we hold on. Friends, it's 2021, a year of healing. Hold on. Friends, something that we learned in the last year is uh, how important relationships are. How important it is to have a group of people, friends, who know really who you are, who are there for each other, 
who pray for each other and support each other. So we have come up with a very simple formula here at the church. It's called worship plus one. And I encourage you in this coming year, the year of healing, follow this formula. Besides just worshiping with us on Sunday, which is so important for our soul, so enriching, so healing, I also invite you to join a class, a group, a ministry here at the church where you meet real people and you develop and invest into real relationships that are built on faith. We have figured out ways how to do it, even during the pandemic. And one of the opportunities that I want to highlight is our Grow Bible Study that we started a few months ago. We resume our classes on January 13th. We meet every Wednesday at 6.30. Right now we do it only on Zoom, and as soon as it is safe enough, we will uh, move to our hybrid um, model. Grow is a Bible study for everyone. Whether you consider yourself a Bible faithful reader and learner and student, you will have some really good opportunities there to learn, to engage others, to participate in conversations. If you've never opened the Bible before, it's a welcoming, open place for you to explore your faith, for you to look into the ancient text and see why are they so relevant, why are they so important for us today. So I hope that if you do not have your worship plus one, if you don't have a group, a class that you are connected to, join us on Wednesdays starting January 13th at 6.30 p.m. And all of the details are on our website. Thank you.
good morning. And before we consider today's scripture readings and today's message, I want to thank the DFW Brass and our musicians for sharing their gifts and leading us in worship. I want to thank our tech team, all of the people who are helping broadcast the service, connect us through technology and the Holy Spirit, no matter where we are coming together today. I'm so glad that you're with us. I introduced myself earlier, but if you missed that, my name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I normally speak at the gathering service. I'm so thankful that you're here with us today. Gathering's a little bit different than it normally is. I normally don't have on liturgical vestments. We normally don't have a professional brass orchestra. We normally don't follow this order of worship. This order of worship is actually the same order of worship we use for memorial and funeral services. And we're doing that intentionally. We're doing that as an opportunity for us who have all just emerged from the traumatic year of 2020. For all of us who experienced grief and loss and hurt in a myriad of forms over the course of the last year, to honestly look it in the face, to recognize it, to not pretend that it didn't happen, to not pretend that it didn't hurt us, to not pretend that it didn't take a cost, and like Mr. Mark said, to let it go. One of the things I do all the time in the gathering is I try to acknowledge that we come to church from a variety of places in our personal life on a Sunday morning. I'll say something like, for all of you who came in feeling great this morning, or for all of you who just barely dragged yourself through the doors today, welcome. I'll say something like that, and I am one of the people who barely dragged themselves through the door this morning. I want to be honest with you. I want to be honest with you. That's how I feel. As I mentioned earlier in the welcome the service of memorial, this, this structure of grieving and loss is not abstract to me this morning. One of our leaders in our church, a good friend and a close colleague, John Howard, passed away on Wednesday evening, complications from COVID. And I'm still stuck right in the middle of my grieving, as is a huge number of the people in our church. And while well, again, this isn't John's service, we'll have a service for John in upcoming days and weeks, and we'll share all the information about that when the time comes. Of course, that's influencing how we're experiencing today, and how we experience all of the last year. One of the reasons I planned this service, planned this service around giving space for us to acknowledge and feel grief, and hopefully to let it go in the face of God's promises and grace, is because I've had such a year of experiencing loss and grief, a year of experiencing trauma and fear, a year of anxiety and hurt. And can I be honest with you? I honestly feel like some of that's Jesus' fault in my life. I kind of do. And I'll tell you what I mean. So I am an unapologetically evangelistic person. Evangelistic person. The Greek word euangelion just means good news. The word evangelistic comes from that word. So a person who's evangelistic thinks that Jesus is good news and is constantly trying to share the good news of Jesus who he is and what he does in our lives, the change that he can make possible for you, the way he can work in your life. An evangelistic person is someone who feels that good news so deeply in their own life that they're just encouraged to share with as many people as they can, hoping that they can experience that good news as well. And experiencing the good news of Jesus isn't just checking a box or, or saying one prayer. It's changing your life. It's changing your life bit by bit and day by day with Jesus' help. It's changing your life into a life that simply follows Jesus, that listens to what he says, that tries to do what he does, treat people like he treated them, take his lessons to heart, care like he cares. And that's where some of the trouble can start. That's where it can get, let's be honest, really hard. Because being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, means starting to care like he cares. And that's different than the way that most of the world lives. All the messages around you in the world right now, whether you realize it or not, all of those messages from the commercials you see on TV to the majority of the fiction that we consume in our homes tells you that you are the most important person in the world. That everything else that's going on in the world only matters to the extent that it makes you happy or feel good. Every, people that don't make you happy or feel good, you can just cut them out, right? Things that don't give you joy or pleasure, get rid of them. Everything's about you, what you buy, what you have, what you earn, what you accomplish. That's what the world tells you to think about yourself, that we're all the top of our little pyramid, and everything else doesn't matter. When you start to follow Jesus, 
when you start to listen to what he says, when you start to care like he cares, you don't think like that anymore. You don't ignore people anymore. You don't separate yourself out from other people anymore. In fact, you do the opposite. You become part of churches. You become part of communities. You become deeply invested in your own family. You become deeply invested in other people's family. You become deeply invested in the lives of your kids. You become deeply invested in the lives of other people's kids. You make connections with people in your community that you might have otherwise overlooked or never seen before. You start reaching out to people who are suffering, people who are struggling, to people who are alienated, to people who are alone. You start caring like Jesus cares. And when you start caring like Jesus cares, it takes you into some tough places. It does. And it fills you with a life so full of connections that at some point, at any given time, there is probably someone with whom you are deeply connected, about whom you deeply care, and with whom you are deeply engaged because of your love of Christ, and they're hurting. And because they're hurting, you're hurting. Not a lot of people will walk around and say, I don't care about many other people. A lot of people will say that. It's not cool to say that. But you can see it in how they act. You can see it in how they treat other people. You can see it in how they conduct their life and their business. Following Jesus means you care deeply about countless other people. And you show up for them. And you be with them. And you care for them. And you help them. And you serve them. Because you care like Jesus cared. And if that's the case for you, then this last year was awful. Because regardless of how things were working out for you, they were going terribly for everybody all around you. That's what I say when some of this is Jesus' fault. If he had never gotten involved in my life, I would have just been living in my own little bubble, the top of my own little pyramid. And unless something directly horrible happened to a few of the handful of people with whom I cared about, it wouldn't have been that big a deal. Instead, I've been following Jesus as closely as I could with everything I had for such a long period of time now that I'm deeply invested in a giant church community in a much larger world, and I'm doing everything I can to be the hands and feet in the light of Christ in his life of many people as I possibly can, and I've been experiencing suffering all around me because of it. Because I'm trying to care like Jesus cares. And you are too. And when we live that way, it hurts. When we live that way, it hurts, and nothing hurts more than death. The specter and the shadow of death has been following each and every one of us this year. 358,000 of our countrymen and women dead this year from a plague. The shadow of death has been following us all in the abstract. Look at how we have to dress when we leave our houses. Look at how we have to conduct ourselves just to go get groceries. Look at all the things that we can't do, can't enjoy. Look at the empty room for worship. Look at the cost that is put on every single one of our lives. Being a Christian is following what Jesus says. It's following what Jesus says. So what does Jesus say to us about death? What does Jesus say to us about death? You know, it's funny. One of the things that informs me a great deal when I'm thinking theologically, when I'm answering questions that people ask me about God or about Christ, one of the things that I think about a lot is, well, what did Jesus say? Because I bet he told us the most important things that we need to know. If there's areas in which we don't know everything, I'll bet that he told us the most important things. That's particularly true when it comes to the reality of death. Jesus doesn't give us a fully fleshed out view of what happens to us on the other side of the grave. I wish he did. I wish he gave us a fully fleshed out view. We knew exactly what was waiting for us. He doesn't give us that, but what he does give us, I must assume, must be the most important thing. He says, I'm Alpha Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I am the resurrection and I am the life. And because I live, he says, and he says this to you, because I live, you also will live. I go to make a place for you. I wouldn't tell you that if it wasn't true. And if I go to make a place for you, I will come get you. 
That's what Jesus tells us about death. That's what Jesus tells us about death. All of that boils down to, I am not leaving you, he says. How I wish that a life of following Jesus was a life of insulation from pain, hurt, and grief. How I wish that a life of following Jesus was a life of a head lived in the clouds that made it that no matter what happened, it didn't bother you or you were constantly joyful and you were constantly happy. That's not been my experience. And it's not been the experience of any other Christian person that I know. Instead, the experiences have been one of caring deeply about so many people that you are constantly surrounded by someone who's suffering, someone who's going through addiction, someone who's going through divorce, someone who's going through grief or loss, someone whose child is struggling, someone who's in the hospital, someone who has died. And yet in the midst of that, experiencing a Christ whose grace is greater still. When I came up to the beginning of our service today, I carried this book. You may have seen it before, you may not have. It's called The Book of Worship. Something that uh, you're given as a gift in our annual conference when you're ordained as an elder or a deacon. I received a copy of it, and basically what it is is it's a direction on all of our different worship services. It's instructions for prayers. If something happens and all of a sudden you find yourself an emergency United Methodist pastor, well, this is what you need. And it's interesting. In the middle of these gold-foiled pages, we have services of Christian marriage. We have services for the consecration of new churches. We have prayers for all these different times of the year. We have worship services for Easter and Christmas and Pentecost and everything in between. And you know what we don't have? A funeral service. There's no funeral service in here. We don't have a memorial service. There's no memorial service in here. There's no funeral or memorial service in the book of worship of our church. You know what there is? You know what there's marked with my red ribbon today? A service of death and resurrection. That's what we have. We have no funeral. We have no memorial. We have a service of death and resurrection. Because what we have in following Christ is not immunity from bad things. What we have in following Christ is not a card that says no matter what, you won't experiencing suffering or loss or hurting. In fact, if you follow Christ, if you care like Christ, you'll be exposed to more suffering and hurting than you would be if you just lived at the top of your own little pyramid caring about nothing but yourself. What we have in following Christ is not insulation from all the hurt and loss that's sometimes general and sometimes specific to exactly the moment that we're in. But what we do have is the promise of death followed by resurrection. What we do have is a Christ who says, I conquered death, and I hold its keys, and because I live, you will live too. What we have is a Christ who doesn't say, don't hurt, don't worry, don't feel the pain, don't care. What we have is a Christ who says, care like I care. Be invested like I'm invested. Be there like I'm there for people. And in the midst of the hurt and the grief and the loss that that causes you, know that my grace is greater still. What we have is a promise of resurrection life. Of resurrection life. What we have is a promise that a life here and now that continues on the other side of our funeral, that acknowledges all this grief, all this pain, all this hurt, was not only worth it, but was matched and overcome by the grace and power of Christ Jesus. I've been praying for my friend John, my colleague, my coworker for a month. I've been praying for him. I've been praying for his family. I've been praying for the healing of his body. I've been praying to take a, borden, a portion of the burden off of his shoulders and onto me. I've been praying for him constantly. Last Sunday, I just drove around the hospital. I couldn't go inside. So I just drove around in the parking lot. Couldn't leave a voice message. It was full. So I just texted him and prayed and texted him and prayed. On Thursday, he was gone. Praying for him still. And I started praying for myself. Christ, in the midst of this grief, in the midst of this loss, 
in the midst of this death. Help me experience in a fresh, in a new way today the good news of the resurrection life that you promised me that you've granted John. And that's here for each and every one of us at the beginning of a new year of healing. Christ offers it to you that resurrection life, the life that overcomes whatever it is that's holding you back as you begin this new year. Don't pretend that it didn't hurt. Don't pretend that you aren't suffering. Don't pretend that it wasn't traumatic. Instead, extend and receive the resurrection grace offered to you by Jesus today. It's a new year. Christ is with us. Let's pray. Great and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, great are you and greatly are you to be praised. And together we praise you for the resurrection life promised to us by Christ Jesus. Your word to us isn't that we won't experience grief or loss, hopelessness or death, but rather that your grace is greater still. So guide us into that resurrection life let all of our hopes and troubles rest in your arms, knowing that you, our all-sufficient sufficient Savior, are with us now and every day. Amen and amen. We're now going to come to a time of communion, of taking the Lord's Supper together. While at your homes, we ask that you get something that's bread or like bread or juice and juice and something like juice as we enter into this time of communion together. It's going to sound a little different than it normally does at the gathering because we're going to do the traditional order of worship communion as it's found in the book of worship. So join me in this time. Uh, there'll be parts where just I speak and parts where I invite you to come along with me. The words will be on the bottom of your screen. So join me now in our time for the Lord's Supper. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right that we should always and everywhere give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose victorious from the dead and comforts us with the blessed hope of everlasting life. And so, with your people on earth in all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you give birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by the water and the spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, 
take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, then he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of this, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and everywhere, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be the world, to the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in communion with all your saints, and all those most dear to us, whom we now remember in the silence of our hearts. Finally, by your grace, bring them and all of us to that table where your saints feast forever in your heavenly home through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now I invite all of you to pray with me, with the confidence of children of God, the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now please receive the gifts of grace and love wherever you are with the elements that you have available at your home.
can't say it any better than the brass just said it before. Both the old rugged cross and when the saints come marching in, what a better, no better way to summarize what it is to end 2020 and be launching into 2021. And so I want to end our service with this special invitation to you. A new year is starting. Don't let it pass you by. The calendar has turned. Don't let it pass you by. A new opportunity is open to you. Do not let it pass you by. If you're one of the people who's been kicking the tires on Christ or on faith or on the concept of becoming embedded in a church community, come forward. Let us know that you're ready to join the church by profession or faith or baptism. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. If you're someone who's a part of the church but hasn't dug in, who hasn't found your place, who doesn't have that sense of belonging, let us know that that's you and we will help you connect. We will help this be the place that helps you have the kind of not only life that's marked by a spirit of hope, but a spirit of resurrection, especially when times get tough. Friends, do not let this year pass you by. The time has come. The time is now. Step forward and take the next step in faith. And let the choir and the orchestra, or the the brass ensemble, lead us in our postlude. bow your heads and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And as you go forward from this place, may you go with the spirit of that resurrection life offered to you through Christ Jesus now and every day. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.